A Lewis dot diagram is a simplified Bohr-Rutherford diagram. Remember the term valence electrons? Since these are the outermost electrons, they are the most vulnerable in either being taken from an atom or added, but more on that later. In general, only the valence shell is important when describing a chemical reaction. So let's see how to draw a Lewis dot diagram based upon yesterday's homework. First, we start with the atomic symbol. For helium, it is capital H, lowercase e. Helium has two valence electrons, so the Lewis dot diagram will have two dots on top. Sodium has one valence electron, so its Lewis dot diagram is Na with one dot on top. Calcium has two valence electrons, so it's Ca with two dots on top. Chlorine has seven valence electrons, so it's Cl with seven dots spread around in pairs. Electrons usually like to orbit in pairs, but we'll save that adventure for grade 11. Drawing a Lewis dot diagram is much simpler than drawing a Bohr-Rutherford diagram. But so far, the only way to determine the number of valence electrons is to draw the Bohr-Rutherford diagram first, which takes a while. What if I told you that there's a super shortcut? It's part of the secret of the periodic table. The word periodic means a repeating pattern, so the periodic table has many patterns hidden inside its funny looking shape. One secret is that all elements in the first group, or column, contain one valence electron. So hydrogen, lithium, sodium, and so forth have one valence electron. The next element to the right will therefore have two valence electrons, so helium will have two valence electrons. You might also notice that there are two elements listed in the first period, or row. Lithium resets to one valence electron, beryllium will have two, skip a few, boron will have three, carbon four, and so forth. The second period concludes with eight valence electrons. On the third period, sodium resets to one, magnesium two, skip a few, blank spaces, three for aluminum, and I think you get the picture. So far, we see that all the alkali metals have one valence electron, and all alkaline earth metals have two valence electrons. But what about these transition metals here in the middle? Unfortunately, it gets messy beyond here. But if you're interested in what happens here, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for grade 11 chemistry in your course selection list for next year. Until then, let's work on some grade 10 examples. Hydrogen in the first column, well, one dot. Same for lithium and sodium. Fluorine is one, two, skip a few, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven dots grouped in pairs. As for bromine, since it's a close cousin with chlorine and fluorine, in the family of, you guessed it, halogens, it will have seven dots. Krypton, being cousins with argon and neon, will have eight electrons. Chlorine, seven. Silicon, one, two, skip a few, three, four valence electrons. Sulfur, Five, six, just like its cousin oxygen, six, calcium in the second group, so two dots, and finally iodine is also a halogen, so seven. Pause this video and try out the next seven on your own. Did you get them all correct? Good, on to the next topic. An ionic compound is formed when a metal and a nonmetal fall in love and bond together. A classic example of an ionic compound is table salt, where sodium and chlorine bond together to form that savory crystal. But before that happens, there is a fundamental rule in chemistry. Rule number one. For any element or compound to become chemically stable, its valence shells must be full. Electrons like to play a game of musical chairs. You remember playing this game as a kid? When the conductor stops playing the music, everybody runs to a chair, and everyone is happy when everybody finds a chair. However, in the game of electron musical chairs, you don't remove chairs one by one. Instead, the chairs are set up in circles, where the innermost circle has two chairs, the second circle has eight chairs, and the third circle has, you guessed it, eight chairs. And we all know that in the game of musical chairs, Everyone is having a blast when all the chairs are filled and no one is left out of the game. In this first example, we notice that there are 10 chairs, but only eight electrons. All the electrons are happy, but the game conductor, or the atom itself, is not happy. 
they need two more electrons to fill in those two empty chairs. In the second example, we notice that there are 18 chairs, but only 12 electrons. Seeing that only two chairs out of the eight are filled in the valence shell, the conductor will angrily remove those two electrons. Why? Because after you remove the two electrons, the inner shell becomes the new valence shell, and it's already full. And that makes the game conductor happy. So then, what happens to these two stray electrons? Well, seeing that the game on the right coincidentally needs two more players, they will join the second group, and now everybody is happy. This is exactly how magnesium and oxygen bond together to form this fiery sparkle show. So this is what happens when metals and nonmetals bond together. In general, metals tend to give up its valence electrons to become chemically stable, and nonmetals take in spare electrons to become chemically stable. Let's go back to the sodium and chlorine example. Sodium only has one valence electron. The conductor would rather get rid of this lonely electron than keep it. This is the reason why sodium is so reactive. You've probably watched videos of sodium placed into water. By the way, all alkali metals are very reactive. Lithium battery packs and cell phones combusting? Yep, that's the reason why. And if you know a little bit about World War history, chlorine gas was used during World War I and drifted in the air as a lethal green-yellow cloud. So if sodium will burn a hole through your mouth and breathing in chlorine gas can kill you, why is table salt so safe to consume? Rule number one. Looking back at the periodic table, sodium has one valence electron, and chlorine has seven valence electrons. Sodium desperately wants to get rid of that one single electron, and chlorine, coincidentally, is looking for one more electron. So the sodium donates that one electron to the chlorine, and as a result, both parties are having a blast. This is why the chemical symbol for table salt is NaCl. For every one sodium, it will bond with one chlorine. Once sodium and chlorine say their marital vows, they will become a new couple with a new couple name, sodium chloride. This, my friend, is called nomenclature, or the grammar of chemistry. When a metal falls in love with a nonmetal, their marital name becomes metal nonmetal, with the nonmetal's last name changed to ide. Here's a quick animation showing how the two atoms consummate their love. Yep, it's that simple. Also, keep in mind that atoms are really, really small. So in one grain of table salt, there are zillions of sodium atoms. And since sodium and chlorine bond together in a one-to-one -one ratio, there is also a zillion chlorine atoms. Next example, aluminum and fluorine. Taking a quick look on the periodic table, aluminum has three valence electrons and fluorine has seven. As for the aluminum, since only three of the eight valence chairs are filled, it is easier for the conductor to get rid of three electrons than to find five more players. The fluorine atom already has seven valence electrons, so it's easier for the conductor to find one more player. So this fluorine will take in one extra electron, and this group will become happy. But what about the aluminum? It still has two more electrons to get rid of. Remember, we're dealing with a mixing bowl that only contains aluminum and fluorine. So there are other fluorines in the mixing bowl. If we add a second fluorine, it will take another spare electron from aluminum. We'll have to add a third fluorine to finish off that last extra electron. Now everyone is happy, but the only way for this to happen is for every one aluminum to bond with three fluorines. This is why the chemical formula for aluminum and fluorine is AlF3. It's not necessary to write down the one, but the three has to be written as a tiny three written below the text baseline as this is part of chemistry grammar. Remember, chemistry is an international language, so no matter which country you are in, ALF3 is the chemical formula for aluminum fluoride. Let's do one last example together. Magnesium with nitrogen. Magnesium has two valence electrons, and nitrogen has five valence electrons. Magnesium will for sure get rid of the two, but nitrogen, seeing it already has five out of the eight, 
it's much easier to find three more electrons than to get rid of five. Magnesium will give away its two donor electrons to nitrogen to become stable, but nitrogen still needs one more. So we'll introduce another magnesium into the game. This second magnesium will give one electron away to the first nitrogen, but it has another one to get rid of as well. So we'll add another nitrogen to the mix. It will take the spare electron from magnesium, but it still needs two more electrons. Lo and behold, one last magnesium will do the trick. We see here that in order for magnesium and nitrogen to become chemically stable, they will need to bond in a 3 to 2 ratio, and will be written as Mg3N2. And the corresponding nomenclature for this is magnesium nitride, not magnesium nitride. That is a common spelling mistake. There's a full page of practice problems for you to have fun with. The link is in the description box below. I recommend that after you've completed your homework, pull out a red pen and compare your answers with the answer key and mark your own homework. This is called self-assessment. It's a great way for you to track your mistakes so that in the future you know what to watch out for. Have fun!